Okay, let's talk about the whole brained approach to professional development, how we get big ideas, how we get impact and momentum. This section, and we're really focusing on momentum. How many times have we felt stuck? You know, just we're done, we're toast. We're just gonna sit here and do nothing. And that's okay if you need to, you know, regroup and relax. But let's talk a little bit about momentum. How can we indeed build our momentum, catch our momentum? All right, there's three areas we really can focus on to keep going and to feel less stuck, right? We can decode the bias because bias is generally a lot of it is unconscious. We're not sure that we didn't, we're not aware that it's happening to us. And we'll go into that. How can we lift the learning? How can we feel even as adults that we can keep learning and keep things exciting and keep growing? And then what is this growth mindset we keep hearing about and how do we practice it? How do we build it in our lives? Well, this is a wonderful quote by Abraham Lincoln. I don't like that man. I must get to know him better. Abe, good old Abe, right? Um, you know, this this quote tells us like if there's something we're not sure about a person, we need to ask more questions. We need to stay curious. We need to figure out people because sometimes our bias is that quick reaction to one thing about the person. But we all have many dimensions to us, right? And so we can't go with the one um, you know, evaluation of one person. We have to give people a chance. I usually tell my kids I have like a three strikes you're out rule and I watch people's behavior. So if they have consistent behavior that is is not uh, aligned with my values, then I don't hang with them, you know, but I give them a chance to get to know them, stay curious, stay humble. They may be able to, um, you know, teach me something, connect me to some resources that would help me. So I don't want to just jump to the first conclusion. How can we put our brain in a good place so that we can decode what's in front of us? And how does the brain even work with biases? Well, it's like a deck of cards. See the cards, the picture of the cards in the upper right. Um, our brain, when we see something, we try to predict what that something is according to what we've seen in the past. Almost like our brain is going through a deck of cards of things we've seen in the past. So it is really strong at predicting. And the only information it can use to predict are patterns it's seen before, or information that's seen before, knowledge that we've read. And here you are today learning. So you're you're putting some new information in so you have more cards to, to sift through. So the brain always tries to predict and it has power, right? So we, the brain has power in that um, the biases can be strong. And once they're conscious and we can understand them and work with them and realize how we can give our brain resources so that it has the neurometabolic power to sift through data and to make informed decisions rather than the fast decisions, right? So just like these images um, below the empty gas tank, you know, sometimes we are in a situation, we're tired, we're hungry, um, we've had a long day of meetings and we're just not in a good place to really look at data in a hard way. So sometimes we have to take time out, right? And relax a little bit and give ourselves some time to look at the, um, the data in front of us. So what else can we learn about unconscious bias? Well, it's those data points being sifted through. And why does the brain do it? The brain does it because it's trying to preserve ourselves. Um, the brain's primary role, run the body and preserve ourselves. And we hear a lot about tigers and running away from tigers in the jungle, you know, in the old days. Um, but really each day in our work situation, our brain is always filtering data points in order to see what is safe, what is not safe. And, and so many of our biases are unconscious. We're not cognizant of our brain kind of sifting through those cards. But how can we each day, you know, put our brain in a good spot so that we can increase our perceptions, we can evaluate data in a more complete, thorough way, rather than just relying on the quick thoughts of um, our potentially involving our biases. Well, this is our perception checklist. We've added a few to it, but we have to make sure that we feel like we belong. Do we feel like we're safe in this environment? Are we safe on our teams? Are we safe in our work environment? Safe meaning, do we feel valued? Um, do we emotionally feel safe? Do you have the kind of team where you could bring up a concern? Or do you wonder, like, would that land okay? Um, because we that is generally what, in these days in knowledge economy, what we determine as safe. Um, there are some physically unsafe areas, of course, where our body's always watching for those. But in the knowledge economy, you know, the office setting, safety, a lot of times is that emotional safety. Can we take a risk and tell you, you know, something we see that maybe, um, you know, that's that's at risk for not going well or an emotion that we have and in regards to a certain project or some thoughts? 
Um, would that land okay with your team and your and your leader of your team? Our own emotional setting will determine as well our perception. So if we're in negative emotions, we will see something a certain way. If we're more positive emotions, we will see the world in a certain way. Um, so we can do some things, and we've talked about this a little bit earlier, is how do we um, adjust or monitor our emotional current emotional setting and take some actions to get ourselves into more positive balance throughout the day um, because it will change our perceptions. Um, and then the team emotions, how do we know how the team is doing, you know, and, and how do we check in with the team? Um, as the team lead, that's something we should be doing. We should be thinking about, you know, what is, uh, what's the team balance? How are they working together? Is it a safe place for people to share their thoughts? And then we personally, as a team lead, we have to know our own neuro setting, right? Are we sympathetic? Are we very focused on a task? We're not like looking out and about, we're really focused down on the data, or are we parasympathetic? We're more in a relaxed state. We're, you know, resting or digesting. Um, and, and that will make a difference on what we see in the data. And it will make a difference if bias is affecting us or not. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then our last meal was our, when was our last meal? What was the quality of our last meal and our sleep? When was our last, um, you know, good night's sleep? And what was the recent quality of our sleep? Why? Because sleep and nutrition matter for our metabolic function of the brain. What about movement, physical fit, fitness? That matters as well. And fun matters. That's the good news. And focus matters. Are we focused on everything going on in the room? Are we focused on a project? Um, you know, we as people in the knowledge economy, we have to learn how to put our blinders on and focus on the task in front of us. So there's many things we can do day to day to enhance our perception of where bias may be present in our teams and in our workplace. There's many different kinds of biases, but we can go over a few of them. One is group think bias. Uh, one of the examples is, you know, let's say you have a, a group of people around the table and uh, one person gives their opinion, the second person gives their opinion, and then there's 12 more people to go around. You may change your opinion because of the group think, you know, what, uh, what the opinions that have already been shared. And attribution bias is if you really believe in someone, you have an affinity bias toward them. Like for me, maybe it would be a woman doctor from Cleveland, Ohio. If I saw someone like that in a meeting, I would say, oh, she's great. You know, I'm sure whatever she says is right. Um, so that's attribution bias is that you will attribute the success to something internally um, and any uh, challenges to something externally. Um, and same thing with affinity bias is that we will um, we will see the good things and challenge less things that look like us. So we have to watch for these biases and they can affect us throughout our work days. So that's why we want to put our brain in a good state so that we can have, um, you know, enhanced perception. Affinity bias. So that's, again, like all the green shirts stay together, like in this image. Again, for me, maybe it would be women docs from Cleveland, Ohio, a certain age. I'm a neurologist, so maybe it would be all the neurologists that were at a certain meeting. Why? Because affinity or similarities are, are safer. It feels like I belong there. Um, and I would connect easier with something that I assume is the same as me. But that would also amplify sameness and equities and limit my curiosity and not put my brain in a good state. So we have to watch out for affinity bias. It can be present. What are some other things we can do to keep going within work and to build our momentum? We can honor the fact that adults still like to learn, right? And the brain is able to learn. We have a growth mindset. We have neuroplasticity. But the brain, as we age, is a little bit harder to learn. So we have to give it more resources, more movement, sleep, fun, nutrition. Um, and then if you're really you know, trying to reach a certain goal, you want to make sure that you have shared it with someone and build a growth team or hang out with people who are growing um, because you want to make sure that you have someone uh, that you're accountable to, somebody that you told you're going to do this and they're going to kind of check in with you, right? All right. So what about belonging and beliefs? Well, culture... Um, you know, I've heard it said that it's like a big uh, glacier, you know, in the top we see, you know, the obvious things of the culture. So in medicine, maybe that would be lab coats or stethoscopes or in neurology, you know, reflex hammers. Um, and then there's the middle, like kind of the known, the values, but then the deeper ones in the culture, that's like the glacier is very deep, hard to get at are the beliefs. And what do we believe about our ability to learn, to grow, um, to challenge, to keep keep building and trying new things at work? Or do we feel like we have one role at work and we always stay in the same role? Um, so we want to make sure that we belong with the people that are the builders, the doers, the creative ones, the ones that are continuing to learn as adults. I love these chia pad heads, huh? 
So growth mindset, you know, we're always, we have the ability to grow and our neurologic system is made to keep getting better and better and more efficient. Um, and that term is called neuroplasticity. So that means the nerves, how they connect, uh, potentially how many nerves there are can be more efficient as we try things and learn new things. So let's just imagine you see a baby learning how to walk. First, you might see them pull themselves up on the chair. You might see them then take a step and fall. And you don't say, oh, you're done. You should never try again. You you encourage them, right? Because you know that they can keep going and learning. Adults are the same. You know, it doesn't look pretty when adults are learning sometimes because we can have to fumble a little bit. We're not good at it. We can put effort into it, but we are not perfect when we start learning, right? So I recently have learned how to play pickleball not good, but I'm trying and I'm learning. I'm learning how to play golf. I'm not good, but I'm learning. And then I usually like to try new art projects or craft projects. Um, and I'm not good at them. I, I made some soap and some came out really weird looking and some came out pretty. So that's okay. You know, I'm going to try things and we have to honor the process over the results. And we as well can do that with our teams. We want to watch for the team members that are really trying, even if it's not a hundred percent success, they're trying, they're, they are putting good effort toward the challenge. And we want to honor that in the growth mindset. And there's a wonderful book by Carol Dweck called The Growth Mindset, who she shares a lot of her research within school systems and in businesses um, where praising the effort and using the term not yet. If you say, I'm not a good golfer yet, it doesn't mean I'm not a good going to be a good golfer someday. And what is good anyway, right? Uh, so I'm just learning and trying new things. So let's um, think about this, you know, so one way we can quote, quote unquote, lazy um, kind of build our growth team. So if we're trying to learn and we want some accountability, we want to put people around us that will help us grow. So what is the goal of networking or having a growth team or having people challenge you like a mentor or a sponsor? Um, the goal is really our health, um, your, you know, ours and others, because we kind of share that we have a synchrony with our health activities. So if I eat healthier, then people that hang out with me would eat healthier. If I go to the doctor, people around me would. And so some of our behaviors as humans are contagious. You know, we share that. We have that synchrony like we've learned about. So same thing with our health and our networking is that we will kind of start mimicking people we hang out with. So there's a saying that goes, you know, we're most like the five people we hang out with or our salary is similar to the five people we hang out with. So if you want to see a change in your in your business opportunities in your professional growth, maybe you know think about the people you hang out with or find some a group that um, like I've been hanging about hanging out with women that are building businesses because I'm learning so much from them and they're challenging me and they're giving me examples of how they're they've been successful or how they've made it through challenges. So that's really helped me to put people around me that are are still learning. The other thing we do within a network is to share resources. We're like a bridge sometimes. Sometimes I don't have all the answers, but I know somebody who's tried something and someone said, I wish I could find X, Y, or Z. We can be the bridge and connect people to resources. And people feel better. They feel more joyful or fulfilled at work if they do have people around them that are challenging them and they can say they have a network. So what are some things, you know, maybe you want to grab a piece of paper and write some of these things down. Um, what are some things? Let's let's answer how to power up our network. Okay. Number one, who supports you personally at work? Is there someone that comes to mind that's just a really great support when you're at work or professionally? Or someone not in your workplace, but that still ch challenges you and supports you in your work growth. Now, one thing I didn't say is you try to come up with three names for each category, and you try not to use the same names in all of these, these questions one through six. It's really hard. Okay, so number one is who supports you personally at work? Number two, who shares their knowledge, their expertise with you? You're trying to think of three people. You can pause the video and answer these. Number three is who provides political support and influences on your behalf? Sometimes that's um, termed a, a mentor, sometimes can do that, or a sponsor. A sponsor is someone who will ask people, you know, a couple steps ahead of you, hey, will you consider this person for this role or, or can this person go on this committee? So a sponsor is doing work for you, trying to open doors for you kind of ahead, ahead of the game. Um, number four, who provides feedback and watches out for your career? Number five, who makes me feel good about my work? Who is that kind of person that supports you? Number six, who helps you stay energized? That's hard, right? 
Okay, and then we look at that. And if you can't think of three people and you can pause the videos throughout so you can go through this at your own time. Um, but if you are finding like, oh, I don't have a lot of names for these. Well, it's fine. You know, you take a pause and, um, you know, you think, then you think, who can I ask? There, if there's someone, if you're not sure who you can put on those, maybe you book a coffee or a tea with someone you say, can I have 10 minutes of your time, whether it be on Zoom or in person? You say, I'm trying to build my network. I heard this crazy talk and I'm supposed to, you know, increase my, I'm supposed to power up my network. Um, so can you give me some advice? I'm looking for someone to do either who is it, you know, the ex knowledge expertise, who helps you feel good about your work, who helps you stay energized. And if you're not sure you're new to a, you know, a certain team or you just moved to the city or something, that's okay. You're going to build this over time. And it's a good idea to have a coffee with someone to kind of get planning about this. What about our own health? And when we're working in, you know, I work in medicine, it's very um, high risk for burnout. Um, how do we take care of our health with our networks? Well, surprisingly, you know, again, we assume the behaviors of those we spend time with. So if you know, look at this list on the lower right here, in the last two weeks, have you spent um, time with someone who prioritizes nutrition, healthy nutrition, um, friends and relationships and stress management and this elusive home homework balance? Um, good sleep, you know, says no to things and sets boundaries so they get their sleep in. It says, you know, it sets up fun things throughout their lives. And you're always like, hey, how are they doing now? Where'd they get that idea? Um, I see some people like that. I'm always like, oh, I got to get take some ideas from them. They look like they do a lot of fun stuff. Um, are they learning? Do you find that they put themselves in that humble position? Like, you know, I'm not going to be good at this at first. I'm going to try. It's going to look like that baby learning how to walk. I'm going to fall. I'm going to flounder a little bit, um, but I'm going to keep trying to grow. Um, and then professionally, are people growing? How about the partner relationship? Do you, do you see someone that you really relation, you really um, respect their partner relationship? What about relaxing? Does anyone out there, you know, set some boundaries? Like, you know what? No, that's my chill day. I'm going to do this, or I'm going to relax for an hour before we do X, Y, or Z. How about movement, exercise? So all of these things, you know, we are, uh, we are in synchrony with people around us. And so if we want to do quote unquote, the lazy way of networking, um, you know, you think about the people you hang out with in the last few weeks. And if you can't, if you see the gaps, that's okay. You know, we're always building our network and you just want to fill in the gaps here. Okay. So that's an exercise for you to think about. So we've talked about, you know, vitality, you know, vitality at home and work. It's the capacity to live and develop. And I really love the fact that it also includes developing. We talk a lot about wellness, but I think um, when I think of like a full life, I think of someone that's always doing something new and learning as well. So I really like my personal goal is to think about vitality. So how to you know live in a purpose-filled way and to continue to develop. So the whole brained approach, you know, I, I we hear a lot about the wholehearted approach, but I like to think of the whole brained approach and to use neuroscience to help us navigate our professional development, to help us get big ideas, to feel like we have an impact that our work matters and to keep some momentum in our workplace and in our professional development so we don't feel stuck like we're against a wall. We talked also about this, you know, this image where, you know, physicians that are burned out the frontal lobe, which is the lobe that helps us kind of control our, um, you know, our emotions, our thoughts, help us take data and assimilate them. You know, it's, that it was less, it's like a gray on the right because other areas of the brain were lit up, but the, the image on the left with the green frontal lobe, that, that means that your frontal, your executive lobe is driving our behaviors. And that's more optimal. We wanna make sure that we know about neuroscience, how to feed different areas of the brain and what it needs so that we can be in the green zone, right? We want the right part of the brain, uh, the frontal lobes that are executive function areas to be well lit up. This is a lovely quote by Malcolm Gladwell, an author and speaker. He states, that is your responsibility as a person, as a human being, to constantly be updating your position on as many things as possible. And if you don't contradict yourself on a regular basis, then you're not thinking. And so we don't wanna take anything for granted. We wanna make sure that we're thinking things through and challenging things and making sure something is still important to us, that we're not stuck in our bias we're keeping our momentum going forward. We're becoming adult learners, lifelong learners, and we're putting ourselves in that humble place where like, we're not going to be perfect at something, right? Okay, if I can help you in any way, you know, feel free to take a screenshot of this QR code that, that has some resources for you or find me in link, LinkedIn. 
um, I'm, just reach out with any questions you might have. Um, I'm glad to support you.